afternoon, so let's uh, hope each one of you can stay in help with that. And also, I had a card. It was just a, a note to let you know I'm doing fine. Miss you all and love you all. And Christian love is Becky Pepper. So we still get cards from her, so it's good to hear from her every now and then. Into our worship service today, our song leader will be Joel Foster, our scripture reading by Barney Miller, our lesson by Dennis Strine, and our closing prayer by Joel Maddox. And we'll begin our worship service with our opening prayer and we'll be with Joel Foster. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful of this day and this time that we have come together, sing songs of praises, study a lesson of your word, commune through the Lord's Supper, have fellowship one with another. We pray that each one that is here this morning will be blessed in their attendance this morning and that of all things you will be uplifted and will accept our worship to you. Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings that we receive. We pray that you would watch over us, care for us, keep us safe. Help us to remain faithful to you, Father. For those that are sick, we pray that you be with those that are waiting on them, that are nursing them back to health, that are treating them, that they'll do things that are most needful to restore their health if it is your will. And Father, we know that you have the power, so if it is your will, we pray that you would restore them to their health. Fathers, we pray that you'd be with the leaders of our country, for our <clears throat> elected officials, for our judges, for our local leaders, for our state leaders, that you would protect them, defeat them from things that are contrary to your will, that they would help us to return more closely to the things that you would have us to be. Father, we pray for each of us that we will stand for your truth and that if the time comes that we're to make a choice whether to follow you or to follow after the dictates of leadership, that we will stand and obey you rather than man. Father, pray that you be with Brother Dennis this morning as he brings us our lesson. Pray that you give him health and long life and that he's able to proclaim your gospel. Pray that you be with each one of us that we uh, listen attentively and take those things and apply them to our lives, our daily lives. Pray now as we enter into this worship service that you would be with each of us, that you would protect those that protect us, our first responders, our military, that you would keep them safe. Help us to appreciate the things as we join into this singing that we will truly teach one another from these songs that we sing. In all things, Father, your will be done, for we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Morning. Seven two six. Seven two six. Mm -hmm. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death. Nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps drawn in streets and plains, thou son of God. But we believe thy footsteps drawn. It's true. 
lifted high amid that wild and savage crew. Nor will we that imploring cry, forgive they know not what they do, but we upon Christ as he hung and died upon that cross for each and every one of us. And if you would, I'm going to read a hymn from our song book. It's uh, 330. If you would like to follow along with us. It's in, in remembrance. It's 330. And it reads, 
On this Lord's day, we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear his blessed word. We recall his broken body as we look upon this bread. Give you thanks, divide, and eat it in my memory, he said. And this crimson cup reminds us of that dread scene long ago when he died in pain and anguish. There his blood was made to flow. There in agony he suffered on the cross for you and me. Now upon the th throne he resigns, blessed Lamb of Calvary. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this exalted favor. Blessed be memorial of his love. The th these thoughts on our mind will now have our prayer for the bread. Our kind of Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to partake of this the bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we as Christians partake of this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we'll continue in prayer for the food of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we'll continue to keep our thoughts focused on Christ as he suffered and bled and died in our stead. As we now partake of this, the cup, which does represent his blood that he shed there on the cross, may we partake in a manner you find pleasing. It's in Christ's name we pray.
that concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is giving back to the Lord as we've been blessed. If you would, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, and it reads, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. <clears throat> Also, uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, it says, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. We'll now have a prayer for our offering. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this opportunity that we have that we can give back a portion unto you that you bound and bless each and every one of us with. We pray as we give back at this time, we'll give back in the manner that's pleasing and cheerful in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Two, five, two. Two, five, two. I am a poor, wayfaring stranger, while traveling through this world of war. Yet there's no sin. That bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan.
Ghost up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. like to read along with me. I'll be reading from Genesis 13 to the end of the chapter. 7 through, 7 through 12. Genesis 13, 7 through 12. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Pezzarite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt go and take the left hand, I will go to the right hand. If thou shalt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. The Lot lifted up his eyes. beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered from everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt has come thou of the Zohar and Lot shows him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. We make a lot of decisions every day. What to wear, what to eat, how to spend our time, what to say. Most of the decisions we make doesn't take a lot of thought. But there are decisions, however, that we do make that require a lot of thought and, and more than likely a lot of prayer. And to some degree or another, we all struggle with making the right decisions. Some of our Daily decisions have life-determining consequences. A married couple doesn't suddenly divorce. No church suddenly splits. Hate is not born overnight. You see, sin's erosion is a slow and silent process based on the small choices that we make every day. Choices determine who and what we are. They determine what kind of life we live, whether or not we are enjoying life or just simply existing, whether we will be happy or live in daily disappointment. The decisions we make determine what kind of relationship we have with God and with each other. Abraham and Lot are the scriptural basis for our lesson this morning. One of them made the right choice and the other did not. And for each of them, their life was determined by their choices. 
we're fully aware, most of us, the account of Abraham. God had called him to leave his home and his family and to go and travel to Canaan for a land that God would show him. But Abraham, he waited a bit. We don't know how long he waited, but it was till after his father had passed away. He finally gets to the land of Canaan, and while there a great famine had occurred, it forced him to leave for Egypt. And as they were getting ready to enter Egypt, Abraham, being fearful that he would be killed because of his wife Sarah, who was very beautiful, had told her to claim that she was his sister. That deception was exposed. They were forced to return from Egypt. And so they returned back to the land of Canaan. In Genesis 13, Barney read about the great herds that Abraham and Lot had. Both these men were well off. But the land that they were living in could not support two great herds. And to avoid a potential conflict between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen, Abraham decided it was time to split up. So Abraham gave Lot the choice of the direction that he would go. East or west? Lot chose the east. And verse 10 gives us the reason why. As Barney read, he lifted up his eyes. Saw the Jordan Valley was well watered. Everywhere the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Lot saw the potential for profit, and he chose it. We, fortunately, have history on our side. We know how all this ends for Lot and his family. And I think we could say with certainty that if Lot had the chance for a do-over, that he would have chose different. But this is the example of the consequences of poor choices that are based on desire. And looking at Abraham, he ended up in a land that we now know of as Israel. His household was blessed. His descendants became a great nation. Abraham made the right choice, Lot, the poor choices. And there is a lot that we can learn from just these two simple chapters. Friends, life is not determined by our stuff. Truthfully, oftentimes it is the source of trouble and unhappiness. What caused the problems between Abraham and Lot? It was their abundance. It was their possessions. You see, the wrong kind of abundance not only battles for our heart, but it also complicates our lives. And at times, it inhibits our decision-making process. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, Paul gives this warning to Timothy. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we know this is true if we would just think about it for a moment. Let's all go back. Not all of you, because a lot of you don't have, some of you don't have that much time here. But think about these simple times when you're older. Let's go back to the time when life was simple. Maybe we were just getting to that age where we were soon leaving the nest. 
There was no concern about payment plans. We weren't worried about investment portfolios or insurance premiums. You remember when you were first starting out, how easy that easy tax form was to fill out? 10 minutes. 10 minutes you were done. Now compare that to what you may have to fill out today. Take hours. Sometimes you even have to get somebody else to do it because what we have is so complicated. Life was simple. Decisions were easier to make. Dr. James Dobson shared a story about a swing set that he bought for his children. And he talked about how difficult it was to put it together and how hard the instructions were to understand. And after he got it all together, he was looking down at the bottom of the instructions and he read this. That he was supposed to oil the joints and tighten the bolts every month. So he came to the conclusion that he did not own that swing set, it owned him. How many of us are slaves to computer technology? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing that many people do? Unplug the phone, look at it to see if there's anything in there that might have happened overnight. Seems like we can't detach ourselves from these things. When Jesus walked this earth, he had very little. When he sent his disciples out on the limited commission, what did he tell them to take or not to take? He said, take what you have on you. Don't take an extra set of clothing. Don't take any food. Don't take any money. But Jesus understood and knew Simpler life was easy to manage. When we look at our lives and our possessions, can we honestly say that they are all essential? Could this be the reason that Paul, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul learned to be content regardless of his circumstances. He learned to stop running after what he didn't have and enjoy what he did have. In the book, Made for His Pleasure, Alistair Begg tells us how to determine if we're struggling with discontent. He said, if faults of money consume your day, if other people's success makes you jealous, if we determine success in terms of what we rather have than what we are in Christ, if we are living in a paralyzing fear of losing everything we have, if we are borrowing ourselves into the bondage of monthly payments, if God gets the leftovers instead of our first fruits, is any of that going on within us? If we begin to see some of these things occurring in our lives, our decision-making process and skills is being compromised. And it might be just time to unclutter life so that we can see more clearly. Friends, good choices start by asking the right questions. When we look back in Genesis 13 and verse 10, he surveyed the options before. He saw well-watered area for his livestock. He saw that the land looked a lot like Egypt. Kind of makes you wonder what he saw in Egypt that he liked. Did he like the big cities? We're never going to know the answer to those questions. 
But what we can see is that Lot was asking the wrong questions. There is no recorded record of him ever praying for wisdom. There's no record of him asking his family what they thought. It's not written anywhere that he was concerned about God's will. Nor was he concerned about what would be the best support system that he could have. You know, all appearances seem to lead us to think that he was motivated purely by profit and pleasure. He was moved by the priority of the urgent. And we do that too, don't we? We run from thing to thing and deal with the things that are screaming at us the loudest. We're constantly putting out fires and we have no real plan for the future. Instead of living by the priority of the urgent, we ought to live by the priority of the important. Focusing on the urgent leads to those things controlling our lives. We start losing sight of the important things in life, like God, family, friends, caring for each other, doing the things that we know are right to do. A lot seem to think what will give me more in terms of riches and advancement and pleasure. These are the wrong questions, right? Maybe he should have asked how best could he serve God? or help to be the person that God wants him to be, or even what's best for his family. He lost everything but two daughters. Everything. He was a poor man. James Boyce, he was a Presbyterian minister. And he said something very profound, and he said it very well. He said, we all think that we're different from Lot. But if we had to put, if we put things ahead of values, if we place job ahead of our family's spiritual life, if we have to put social and political advancement ahead of a proper association with God and his people, if we have let our choices keep us away from a church in which we can grow in faith and worship, we have moved from the highlands to the plain of Jordan. If our focus is on the external instead of the spiritual, we are focusing on the wrong issues. If we are seeking status instead of character, we are focusing on the wrong thing. If we're concerned about the cost of something monetarily instead of spiritually, we are focused on the wrong thing. And if our focus is on the pleasurable instead of the benefits, we are focused on the wrong issues. Christians, as Christians, we're to be different from the world. And if we want to make good choices, we must ask the right questions. And in every decision we make, great or small, we must trust in God's providence. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about Abraham was his change in attitude. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, in verses 10 through 13, Abraham relied on his own decision. Now, we didn't read anywhere where he might have asked God, what do I need to do? How can I provide for my family? What, what are you going to do for me? He didn't seek God's counsel. We have no evidence of that. He decided to go. He decided to lie and to distort the truth to protect himself. But then in chapter 13, we see a profound change 
in verse 4, it says that Abraham came back to the place where he had built his altar. And there he called on the name of the Lord. From this account, we can see that when we are absent from God, it clouds our judgment. When we are leading our lives instead of relying on God to lead, when we choose to stay away from services, when we choose to be disconnected from God and his people, it inhibits our decision-making process considerably. Spending time with God allowed Abraham to see clearly again. He remembered that he was in God's hands, that his future was not uncertain, that God was leading the way. You know, we many might think, well, Abraham got what he got because Lot chose the other. He got the leftovers. But I say that's not the case. I think it was because Abraham trusted God so much that whatever choice Lot made, he would be okay. And so he was confident enough in God's providence and God's protection to allow Lot to make the choice. And he would accept whatever he got. He knew that God would care for him. Our nation, we as individuals, families, are struggling. Sometimes I joke that they're going to have to put a loan office in front of the grocery store so you can take out a loan to get a gallon of milk. I jest in that area, but it's hard. We see the social and political climate in our nation today in disarray. But know this, God is in control. God loves us. God's not going to leave us. And God is working in all things for our benefit. And one other thing, God never makes a mistake in his timing of events. Never. So we need to live by faith in the face of these facts. If we trust in God's promises, we will make the best decisions we can and then trust God to do the rest. When we have decisions to make, I'm not talking about the simple decisions. I'm talking the decisions that will affect our lives. God first. Consult his word for guidance. And if it's still a struggle, ask someone who is wise enough and experienced enough for help. Abraham made his choice. He trusted God for the rest of it. Abraham ended up in God's list in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. And like Abraham, faith in God will enhance our decision-making process. In this moment in time, we all have a decision to make. One, how will we respond to God's gift of salvation? God sent Jesus to this earth in the exact moment that was necessary to come. God knew that the path that the world was on was spiraling out of control. It had been for centuries. 
And the only thing in man's future at that point was death. That was it. But he sent his son to bring us the gospel, to bring us grace and mercy and peace. If you're not a child of God, you can have those things today. Through repentance, confession, being baptized for the remission of sins, you can become that child of God. And God will take care of you. That is a promise. As long as you continue to grow and trust in Him. And if you are a child of God and you need to make a decision this morning, to make things right with God. The opportunity is available to you at this moment as together we stand and we sing. Come. <clears throat> Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. There's danger and death in delaying. Accept God's saving. His life on the cross he has given, oh come while yet you may, he's earnestly pleading, oh make no delay, tomorrow may be too late, today is the day of salvation, tomorrow may be too late. The judgment day, brother, is coming. Prepare ye for that day. His pardon and mercy he offers. Obey while yet you may. He'll save you from sin and bring sweet peace within. Tomorrow may be too late. Today. Repent and confess and be baptized. There is no other way. Give Jesus your life and thus walk in his way. Tomorrow may be too late. Thank you so much for your presence this morning. We urge you to can to be back this evening at five for our evening worship. We're so thankful for our visitors. We appreciate you being here. Hope you'll stay around for a few minutes after our service so that you can uh, we can get to know you. At this time, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Our kind heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we've had to come here this morning sing songs of praises unto thee to hear a portion of thy word spoken unto us we pray that we will take the things we have heard and apply them to our lives that we will become strong christians that we will teach others of thy word we pray that you would be with the ones that are sick we pray that you would be with our shut-ins that you would the ones that are attending the each and every one of these and they did the right thing and they're be able to come back and worship you very shortly. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us, you would forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.